we've gone from being a stable, prosperous democracy to a country that is on the verge of having its democracy collapse, right? That is a real threat. Hi, I'm Shoma Chaudhary. Thanks for watching Inquiry. Over the last few weeks, there's been a bitter, fierce debate in America as an unprecedented leak from the Supreme Court showed that it is set to overturn abortion rights for women, which was legalized almost 50 years ago. The Democrats have failed to win a vote in the Senate, which would turn these rights into federal law. This just seems the start of an alarming rollback on civil rights and justice issues that seemed long settled in the free world including the universal right to vote, LGBTQ rights, as well as racial equity. So what explains this toxic culture war in America? Why is its democratic fabric split wide open? Why is there a convergence with financial elites and the resentments of working class? Why is there an explosion of cultural and religious conservatism? And why is there a pushback on the liberal secular progressive project? To analyze all of this, I have a fantastic guest on Inquiry today, Jacob S. Hacker. Jacob is a professor at Yale and a political scientist, and he and Paul Pearson have written several books, including Let Them Eat Tweets, which explores a phenomenon called plutocratic populism, which is really eroding the basis and foundation of American democracy. I spoke to him a couple of days ago. Do watch. So Jacob Paulin, you are often described as the Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson of political science in America. So it's a privilege to have you on my show. Thank you for joining me on Inquiry. Thank you so much. I have to say that uh, we really appreciated that Bill Moyers said that. But at the same time, we spent the last 10 years arguing over who gets to be Sherlock Holmes and who's Dr. Watson. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Paul's not here. So uh uh, but I'm not going to assert anything more than that. So, but yeah, it's great. It, Paul and I have had a really collaborative, productive collaborative relationship now for a long time. Jacob, I reached out to you because, you know, the abortion debate in America and the leak and the, you know, imminent withdrawal of rights by the Supreme Court is kind of caught the world's attention. It has massive implications, not just for America, it's spilling into Canada, it's going to have significance everywhere else. So all these issues of justice and civil liberties that one took for granted, that you know, America has kind of positioned itself as the vanguard of those liberties, all of it suddenly split wide open. You know? So what has led to this? You know, what is the run up to this? What is your interpretation of why America's in this uh, toxic divide right now? Yeah, so it's a long backstory, but I think the, the most recent developments that are really important to understand is that we, have a system that has essentially become more and more tilted towards uh, the sentiments of a intense um, rural minority, rurally located minority in the United States. And so it's not just that um, we've seen this longstanding culture war over abortion, it's gotten more intense. And it's increasingly been the case that those who are on the, who are, who were on the losing end side of the culture war are now deeply, you know, greatly advantaged by the structure of our political system. And, um, and those advantages are both that, you know, Republicans have an edge in many states, because uh, some states, they're just very conservative, but in others, like Wisconsin, say, it's because the Republicans have gerrymandered districts to make it much easier for them to win. And it's also that Republicans have managed to win the presidency twice in the last you know, 20 years without having won the popular vote. And um, they also have an edge in the Senate, which means that we have a 6-3 conservative majority on the Supreme Court. And so I think this, this is what I think a lot of people miss about the, the cultural and social and racial polarization in the United States. It's, it's far from a fair fight. So Republicans really emphasize these cultural and racial issues because it helps hold their coalition together. It, it keeps business leaders happy. Uh, at least relatively happy because it means that they're not offering public policies that are really helpful to the less affluent people in the coalition. Um, so it holds the coalition together, but because the, the coalition has such an advantage in our political system, they're gaining power. And so what we're just seeing 20 or 30 years ago as fights that the, the right would never win are now fights that again and again, they're winning. They're winning on abortion, they're winning on the restriction of voting rights. Um, they're winning in terms of 
um, this really big push to kind of demonize transgender people, um, LBGQT people in general. Um, they're winning in terms of re continuing to reshape the courts. Um, so there's just a lot of areas in where Republicans are gaining, despite the fact that a majority of Americans are not with them. So, you know, that's a, a huge point you're making, Jacob. So you're saying that just structurally, because of the way the Electoral College uh, is, is created in America, that there's a disconnect between the popular sentiment and what policy is being created. Is that what you're saying? Because exactly. But at another level, there's also a, a, a dismaying sense that there's a very clear divide in the population as well, you know, that there is a popular sentiment backing this and that it's been given voice. And, you know, uh, Trump's presidency actually saw a big rise in the voting share as well, you know, so even though he lost to Biden, uh, the vote share patterns were quite uh, disturbing and worrying. So while there are these structures, do you think that there's something uh, like a deeper cultural political divide, uh, you know, which is beyond just the structures. And we'll come back to that. But is, is this a part of American society actually finding voice through all this? Yes, absolutely. And so there is, I mean, the crucial thing is that the divide used to be one that um, both cross cut the parties um, and was relatively orthogonal to the geographic divide between prosperous metro areas and those who live, you know, places outside of those metro places where prosperity has grown. And so it's the fact that you have this growing alignment between, let's just say rurality, <laughs> it's a kind of hard word to stomach, or, yeah. or maybe there's a growing alignment between the metro non-metro divide and this deep cultural, economic, racial polarization that has um, that has divided the parties, and so that's what's going on. And um, there, there's also we can talk more about this, but there's also the fact that for the Republican Party, as I said, they have really emphasized these issues, right? And I think at one point in time, it was thought, oh, you know, they emphasized critical race theory or um, abortion because it's a kind of symbolic rallying cry, but it's not substantive because they don't have the power to actually implement this agenda. And um, now, now because of these biases, they have the power to implement this agenda. So your point about Trump is absolutely right. Trump expanded the Republican base, and he did so by marrying that kind of culture war with a slightly more economically populist um, agenda. But it is worth noting that like he lost the election by a pretty significant margin despite being the incumbent. In the United States, incumbent presidents get elected two, -third of, two thirds of the time. So yeah. I think, you know, he, he did manage to rally this base, but he, and because of these advantages in the electoral college, you know, he came a lot closer than, than he should have if we had a popular vote, but, yeah. but he still did lose. And so, um, I, I, it's not that much comfort in our system because I think what we've learned is that, you know, in other, in most countries, right-wing populists, and this is not true of India, but in most countries, right-wing populists don't have the ability to gain uh, a majority of the vote and they don't have major party um, backing, right? So in, in, you know, in those countries, most of them using proportional representation systems, right-wing populists, have influence because you can you have to sort of take an account of them, but they don't actually take over a major party in a two party system, which is what's happened in the United States. You know, there's been a lot of discussion about particularly the, this glaring problem in America's democracy, which is the electoral college versus the popular. Yes. But, you know, in your book, let them eat tweets. You have a very interesting phrase, you know, uh, plutocratic populism which yeah. seems to explain a lot of what's going on. And so I don't think people have really understood uh, or, or this deep connection between, say, you know, this, uh, this abortion, fierce abortion debate and economic inequality, you know. So can you help us understand? And I think the history of the Republican Party is very much uh, entwined with where in American democracy finds itself right now. So can you help our audience not familiar with it, that what you mean by plutocratic yeah. populism? Yeah. So. You're absolutely right. Um, and indeed, if you look at the formation of democracies, there's a wonderful book by Daniel Zeblatt called 
about conservative parties and the birth of democracy. And he emphasizes that it's really conservative parties that at the birth of democracy are kind of the switchmen of history, right? If conservative parties uh, are, are willing to moderate and sort of uh, accept a, a society in which less affluent people can vote and have power, then um, you get a transition to democracy. And if they don't, democracies can be very fragile, as was true in Germany, for example. And um, so in the United States, we obviously made that transition and we've had a very robust democracy historically. But over the last 35 or 40 years, we've seen this stunning rise in inequality. And it's essentially created the same kinds of pressures on America's conservative party, the Republican Party, that were faced by conservative parties in other countries a century ago. And the pressure is basically this. As inequality grows, the gap between the traditional backers of conservative parties, namely wealthy people in business, and the less affluent voters that conservative parties need to win grows, right? So there's essentially a, a real problem for conservative parties of figuring out, well, how do they stay true to this older defense of wealth and power, but also reach out to less affluent voters? I mean, and in the US, you can think it's like, how do you reach out to the white working class, right? I mean, and the Republican Party has increasingly become a party that the core of its voters are white, white voters without a college degree, right? So, so to, if you're a party trying to make that, 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 um, that transit to a, a majoritarian or at least near majoritarian party uh, in this new unequal context, then you have to come up with some issues that allow you to track those voters without emphasizing pocketbook uh, concerns, right? You, you're, you're not gonna say as some right-wing populists do in Europe, right? We, we believe in a white, big welfare state for white people, right? Instead, what you say is we've got to, we've got to outlaw, you know, ban abortion. We've got to deal with the fact that, um, you know, uh, we're becoming a majority minority nation and, and, you know, immigrants are coming across our borders and are voting for Democrats. And, you know, all of these, tropes that the, that, the, that the right has used to, to essentially mobilize uh, less affluent white voters. So that's the story of plutocratic populism because the Republican Party remains extremely plutocratic in its core economic policies. I mean, Donald Trump comes into office, right, running this campaign that is much more critical of sort of mainstream Republican thinking and economic orthodoxy than previous Republican campaigns. But what are the two things that are the biggest legislative priorities of his first year? There are a tax cut that goes overwhelmingly to the richest Americans. Two thirds of it goes to the richest 1% of Americans. And he tries to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act, which is this policy that benefits many of the people who voted for them, uh, voted for him and for his Republican allies. So that's to me, really revealing about the nature of this uh, coalition. And I think in a way we're seeing it become sort of, it's, it's the, the plutocratic and the populist side are fracturing a bit recently. Like I think that's part of what's going on is that there is, um, there is more and more tension between the business side of the party and the more uh, right-wing populist side of the party. And the right-wing populist side of the party has all the energy, <laughs> has most of the energy. They don't have the lobbyists, but they have most of the energy. And so what you see in, in, in the current races, right, is that whoever is the most Trumpist candidate, right, um, even if Trump doesn't endorse that candidate, is, is, is often favored in Republican primaries. But it's still the case that the party seems to be committed to, if it gets back into power, doing things that help corporations and the rich and uh, deregulation, tax cuts for the rich um, and, and the like. So, I mean, just to emphasize the irony of what you're saying, you know, so you're, the Republican Party is just all its economic policies weighted towards the rich, and yet they're channeling working class resentments, you know, and yes. your point is that it's pretty much a, like it's it's almost like a very conscious strategy uh, that they're doing. And Trump, I mean, I was reading a fascinating statistic that almost 72 percent of his administration were made up of rich corporates and very, very wealthy businessmen, you know, and yet right. he was the champion of the working class. So that's yeah, really yeah, no, exactly. Um, I mean, Trump himself, right, um, is, uh, you know, a, a, a businessman who has um, done a ton of things that are quite harmful to, to the people who work for him, uh, particularly those who are most vulnerable. But, but I think, you know, I think we want to be careful here. I, I do want to say that there was, there were a couple issues that um, where Trump really did 
push the Republican Party in a new direction. One of them was trade, um, and one of them was uh, immigration. So the party had essentially been divided over immigration. And you know, back in 2012, when Mitt Romney lost, they, they, they had this big report, which was called the autopsy. And basically, the report said, if Repub I, I can sum up the report, Lindsey Graham had a great quote at the time. He said, uh, you know, we, uh, we can't be the party of angry white men, right? There's not enough angry white men for us to stay in power. And, um, and Trump basically decided there are enough angry white men, if you work hard enough, there, and angry white women, uh, to stay in power. And so he pushed the party to significantly to the right on immigration. And I don't think that's as much of an economic policy as really tied up with this question of American identity and culture and so on. But that's a big shift. Um, the other thing was on trade. And there, again, the Republican Party had had divisions over trade, and Trump became much more protectionist. And you know, I think that, in a way, is the one example of a policy where it seemed responsive, if you will, to the areas that had really gotten harmed in the 1990s and uh, sorry, in the 2000s and 2010s by NAFTA, by the rise of China and India, uh, for that matter, as competitors. But the evidence is that it wasn't very helpful, actually, to many of these areas. And then meanwhile, the rest of Trump's policies were essentially pulling support away from these areas, not doing anything to deal in a serious way with the opioid epidemic and so on. So it's really clear that, um, that on economic policy, the party remains kind of in the thrall of this sort of conservative plutocratic mindset that has, um, that has really done a lot of damage to the very areas and very people who are most committed to supporting Donald Trump and, and the party. So exactly the irony you say. So, you know, I'm going to, uh, I want to ask you about why then uh, the Democrats' welfare agenda, you know, health for all, et cetera, doesn't have more emotional cachet uh, in the voting public and even amongst the work working classes. Uh, and, you know, what about the liberal progressive agenda pisses people off, you know, and Michael Sandel yeah. speaks of that as well. So I, I want your thoughts on that. But before that, you know, you mentioned Mitt Romney, and I was very interested in your book. You actually almost find a kind of, pivotal figure, you know, which was Lee Atwater, you know, in Reagan's administration, uh, who kind of really saw this opportunity about how to cover up the in, uh, economic divide with creating uh, infrastructure of outrage, you know. So again, can you talk about that a little, like why did yeah. you work on those? And Mitt Romney, you make a wonderful contrast between George Romney and Mitt Romney uh, to capture yes. how the Republican Party has changed. So can you talk about right. it a little so Lee Atwater is this fascinating figure. Um, for those who don't know, he was a person who um, uh, came up with the Willie Horton ad, the so-called Willie Horton ad that was used against Michael Dukakis and George H.W. Bush's 1988 campaign. So this ad pictured a menacing black man, w William Horton, who had committed a heinous crime and said that Dukakis had basically released this guy from jail under a furlough program when he was governor. Um, it was incendiary. It was a new level of kind of race, ra you know, in the modern era, it was a kind of new level of um, playing the race card or, you know, racial dog whistle. And Atwater was brilliant at this. So he understood, and he was from the South, he understood that where Republicans needed to pick up votes was among less affluent Southern voters, right? Working class Southern voters. And he said, these guys are not country club Republicans. They could not care. They want to raise taxes. You know, they're pretty into Social Security and Medicare. What they are, what, what really drives them is what he called populism, right? This sense they want the nation to be strong. They sense that they're losing the kind of world they had. And, you know, he didn't have to say it, but the, it was clear that their sense that Black people were gaining too much power, right? And so Atwater um, orchestrated this 188 campaign, but his ideas kind of came to sort of define the modern electoral strategy of the Republican Party to the point that when H.W. Bush's son, George W. Bush, who was like the embodiment of a corporate, Demo uh, corporate Republican, right? He was so close to business and, and oil companies and the like, and his big signature issue was a tax cut. Nonetheless, when John McCain was challenging him and McCain was saying, we shouldn't cut taxes that much for rich people. Um, he ran this incredibly dirty campaign in South Carolina, which is where Atwater was from. Atwater had passed away by then. Um, and he ran this incredibly dirty campaign in South Carolina where he essentially uh, implied 
that McCain had fathered an out of wedlock uh, non-white child, which was actually, and this is the saddest part of it, it's actually, a, he had adopted a child from Bangladesh, right? McCain had adopted a child from Bangladesh. But, um, and of course, Bush didn't do this directly. He worked through all these surrogates. And so one thing that I think I haven't mentioned, but it's really important is I'm describing this as like a Republican strategy. And you're right, there was a conscious element to it, but also it was about forming these alliances with outrage stoking groups like the National Rifle Association, like the anti-abortion warriors, the evangelical movement and the emerging world of right-wing media, right? So in outsourcing, if you will, grassroots mobilization to these groups, the party gained a lot, but it also lost a lot of control over exactly what the party what the, the, the forces on the ground were doing. So we call, you know, these are like the groups with troops and you need groups with troops to be a successful party, but you also need the people who get the, the troops riled up and, and they, they have their own agendas. And so the party became increasingly oriented around the most extreme kind of right-wing cultural um, uh, themes and claims and goals. Well, so, you know, that kind of helps explain, like I was saying, why what, everything that one thought was settled on issues of justice and civil liberties. You think that these are like human values that yeah. almost the entire world has kind of, at least the democratic world has agreed upon, and suddenly it's all ripped apart. So, but you're saying that this movement was going on like from back from the 70s and 80s. Uh, yeah, to, absolutely. Yeah. And George Romney, just to say, so George Romney was Mitt Romney's father, and he was an old moderate Republican um, it, from the business world. Um, and the reason that that contrast is really revealing is that Mitt Romney wanted to, you know, George Romney wanted to moderate the party, right? And in particular, he felt like business had to be kind of a social partner with, um, with uh, democracy. And his son, Mitt Romney, who now looks like a moderate, but pretty conservative <laughs> compared with where the Republican Party had been, we, his we son that, was- We know that phenomenon here in India, you know? Suddenly yeah. the old conservatives look like, you know, yes. really sort of wonderful statesmen, you know? So. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So, um, so anyway, Mitt Romney was from the world of financial capital, you know, and we've had this massive financialization of the economy. And for these folks, companies are like basically like um, they're they're like financial investment opportunities and you kind of break them up and load them with debt, fire a lot of the workers. And the point we were making in contrasting George and Mitt Romney is that that's what's happened to, you know, capital in the United States. It's become increasingly, uh, it's inc become increasingly uh, focused on, you know, profit over people and um, on uh, global Financial. rather than American global rather than American workers and incredibly aggressive in terms of its strategies, both in, in the market and in politics. And that that aggressive business world comes together with this increasingly outsourced, aggressive right wing, you know, uh, 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 mobilization and creates this pretty toxic combination that hits us in, in 2020, 2016. Um, and in a lot of ways, right, Trump, Trump is kind of a reaction against some of it, but he takes it even further, right? He's a reaction against the kind of, Mitt, you know, Mitt Romney is of course, like for him, you know, a corporate tool, like that's the old Republican party. I'm the new outsider who is, but in the end, right, he just adopts all the policies of the Republican party. And meanwhile, doubles down on this, racial racial outrage cultural outrage strategy well <laughs> you know i mean yeah. there's so many sort of uh, nuances there even about uh, you know how trump positioned himself because yeah. there's some uh, resonances there for india which is like the you know when you were talking about that rural the the lack of self esteem that the liberals have made mistakes about you know where you make people feel rustic you make their emotional landscape yeah. feel gauche and non kosher uh, and you know and uh, trump actually yeah. was giving that voice against the old country club i mean he's the exactly. new rich versus the new brash rich versus the old nabob rich you know so exactly and the other thing to say is that, and I think this is something Democrats have struggled with, and we, so we can talk about how the Democrats have, have handled their current situation, but that Trump, Trump responded to the reality that for a lot of the people who 
uh, who are coming from these areas that were economically distressed, who have lost manufacturing, who've had opi been ravaged by the opioid epidemic, that for a lot of them, status was more important than income, right? For a lot of them, there was a sense that they no longer had in recognized the society and they no longer had power in the society. And, and I do think we tend to ignore status conflict and status um, dilemmas at our peril as because in politics, it's such a powerful uh, force. And, um, and so what we're seeing, I think, is that as the U.S. has essentially um, divided and sorted into these two camps, those camps are very much associated with different parts of the country and different types of political economies, right? So you've got a, a non-urban, more extraction-oriented, more small-town-oriented economy, much less diverse, uh, both economically and racially, right? And that area has lost, remember, this was the center of the economy in many cases, right? There was industry in a lot of these places, right? Agriculture was a much broader based industry. Now, of course, agriculture is like a, a big business with a small number of very, very, very rich people. And so market concentration has occurred so that, you know, uh, the big companies, they're largely not um, you know, located in these areas. So that all the small businesses, all the kind of local bastions of the community, the nonprofits that used to support the community, those have disappeared. So those areas, I think, are one political economy. And then we have an urban, knowledge-oriented, cosmopolitan, globally-oriented political economy, right? And Trump's genius was to recognize this side, right? And to really focus on it. And, and to a significant extent, the party, even though it had played up these culture war issues, had not done that. Um, and I think that's really the, that was the key to making all these kind of disparate issues, some of which made no sense kind of uh, to work together. Some of them made no sense going together to work, to work together. Yeah. No, when you're talking about his capacity, it's like that demagogue's uh, skill of understanding the psyche, because it's also interesting how much of the Hispanic vote moved to him, uh, you know, during his time, but we'll, we'll get sidetracked too well, much. And well, and it wasn't as much as we're sometimes uh, led to believe, but if you start to look at where the Hispanic vote moved towards him, it actually reflects the story I'm telling you about how there's sort of two political economies. So a lot of it's in places that are um, places where in Texas, Florida, right, where you see where the Hispanic community both has much more hostility towards socialism and where also it's much more likely to see itself as tied to this older uh, extraction oriented economy. So I, I think the the challenge for the, the Republican Party has always been how to manage this class conflict and to deal with the fact that like its core voters are, are getting a lot older. Um, meanwhile, our country is growing much more diverse. The challenge for Democrats is the flip side of that, right? Um, so they've been losing these working class voters and they have this coalition, right, that is um, underrepresented in our political system for a variety of reasons, and much more diverse, um, both economically and racially. And so, uh, and I think that's when you see Biden come in with the pandemic having occurred, with this uh, huge fight over racial justice um, that's continuing, that begins, um, it's a longstanding fight, but it gets invigorated in 2020, they're having to figure out, well, how do we manage our far-flung coalition and changing coalition. So, Jacob, just to come in here, because there's some resonances here for India. I mean, it's a very different setting, but there's some common strands here. So, you know, when you're uh, analyzing why the Democrats are not getting the kind of, you know, emotional hold on the working class, because there again, there's a huge uh, irony, you know, because the Democrats are pro a more socialist state, a larger government, you know, some amount of welfare, equality of opportunity. Uh, and yet they're not able to speak to, you know, this working class resentments and emotions that we were speaking of. And so they're losing the working class vote. And here I just wanted to bring in, you know, I'm, I'm going on referring to Michael Sandel because I found that interesting where he said, you know, there's a great need to redistribute self-esteem uh, along with redistribution of money, you know. So because we started off with the abortion debate, um, I think the big issue is, how do you cling to creating a welfare state, you know, larger government, stay committed to civil liberties and justice and the rights of the individual, and yet keep a large community that's 
more conservative, you know, more religious, more, uh, you know, I mean, I don't even want to use a judgmental word, but yeah, regressive on individual rights, but are more community oriented. So that's the big dilemma. Now, how do you, how do you see the Democrats? Yeah. Where did they fail, first of all, before we figure out how to fix this? Well, we Where don't know if they, so, so we should say, first of all, that um, the, there are three things to say in judging that whether they failed. First, they did get a lot in the American Rescue Plan. Two, uh, which would pass, uh, obviously, which this is the, the, the initial um, big relief plan, which was enormous um, by historical standards that began passed right after Biden took, took office. Yeah. Um, two, we don't know uh, if Build Back Better, as it's been called, is is dead or just sleeping. So I'm reminded of that Monte Python skit with the bird. The guy brings back the bird. The bird is clearly dead. But the 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 owner of the shop says, no, 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 it's just sleeping. And he goes, no, no, it's dead. It's, and he goes, no, it's sleeping. It's got that, look at the beautiful plumage. So I don't know if um, it's sleeping uh, or dead. It's not going to be anything close to what Democrats had originally wanted if it's sleeping and wakes up. But um, but I think there is still prospect of something substantial happening. Um, but it's pro it's getting slimmer and slimmer. So I just that's a caveat. The third is that Democrats might lose in the midterms no matter what they do. Right? They have very slim margins. The incumbent, the president's party loses seats in almost as a like pure historical regularity. There's a few exceptions, but so I want to I want to kind of start with that oh, before yeah. we say so I. And I guess the most important thing to say, it's not part of these three caveats, is that they got close, right? 40, you know, 48 Democrats, and they needed 50 to in the Senate, 48 Democrats in the Senate were on board with the whole thing, right? Only Kristen Sinema, who was kind of half on board, and Joe Manchin, who was definitely not on board, were the, were the holdouts. Um, and so, you know, politics sorry, is sorry, very- Jacob, just, just to make my question more pointed. Yeah is that I'm not necessarily talking so much about the, the electoral and political strength of the two yeah. parties, but that, you know, this great rift in the fabric of Indian democ uh, of American democracy, uh, that, you know, what role do the Democrats and the liberal elites have to play in that? You know, we've analyzed what the Republicans are doing wrong, yes. but I'm not necessarily talking about who's winning and losing, but okay. this great divide, and that's now true of everywhere in the world, you know, that why yeah. is the liberal, secular, progressive project so compromised in people's minds uh, emotionally or culturally? Or yeah. And that's in, in many ways a more important question. I will say I'm very fixated on this short term question, because if Donald Trump regains the presidency in 2024, we're, you know, American democracy is in very deep trouble. So um, so a lot. Uh, you know, I'm reminded of, you know, the, the John Maynard Keynes quote that in the long run, we're all dead, right? So in the long run, American democracy might be dead. So to come back, so I think that I think there are two kind of, um, there are two things to say here. One is that the Democratic Party went significantly to the right on some economic issues, including deregulation and free trade. Um, and both of those I think really hurt its capacity to mobilize working class Americans. The evidence has come in on the effect of NAFTA and uh, the China's entry into the WTO, and it was devastated Democrats in in non-urban parts of the country. And it's it's absolutely clear. And the party also became more in the thrall of this idea that you know we'll let markets be markets, we'll deregulate finance, and then we'll kind of redistribute afterwards. And that's not popular among most voters. I think this point about Voters care about self-esteem. Just getting a check is not about self-esteem. They want to keep the jobs that they had, or at least have a, a shot at a good job. And so those two things that th that really hurt the Democrats. The other thing that um, that I think it's clear that the Democrats are perceived right as being elitist, um, too woke on race, you know, and um, and there I think that. There's truth to that, but the the but I actually think the Democrats, when they came in in two, 2020, were trying to address that by focusing on a kind of bread and butter economic agenda, as you said, expanding the welfare state. And their theory, and not and not a crazy theory, was like we're going to do these big things, and they're going to put money in people's pockets, and that's going to make them more supportive of of the party. And we're not going to we're trying not to deal with all that other stuff right now, and. Um, and I think probably, you know, again, 
they didn't get the the votes they needed um, to do the big stuff. So prop, that was clearly not a uh, winning strategy, but it meant it was not a foolish one, I don't think. Um, and the the challenge I think is is that they are the party of government and the party of democracy now. Um, being the party of government means most Americans really don't like American government. If you want to expand the welfare state, they like the idea of the benefits. In fact, most of the policies that Biden has been advocating have strong support. But then you start to dig into it, and most people don't trust government at all, right? The federal government in particular. And they're also the party of democracy, which is challenging, right? Because essentially they have to decide are we going, like, do we put our emphasis on you know, uh, providing kind of concrete benefits? Or are we going to like try to get a voting rights bill passed? And they didn't really handle that very well. They didn't get, they haven't really gotten any political reform through. And to me, that's the biggest missed opportunity in many ways, right? There, you know, we may not have gotten paid leave no matter what, but, but could we have gotten um, rules that would make sure that, that these states right now, that these Republican states that are restricting democracy, that they wouldn't be able to do that? Maybe. I don't know. But, you know, uh, Jacob, you, I mean, there's just so many interesting things you've said in your books and your writing that I'm wondering which one to pick on. But you just said about this role of government in American democracy, you know, and you have a very interesting thesis about how actually if any of this is to be fixed, then there has to be faith in government. Government has to come back to play its role. And in American Amnesia, you, uh, you know, wrote about how this distrust of government actually is leading up to a lot of the, this toxic divide, uh, you know, and yeah. there the are reasons for that as well. But before I bring you into that, uh, you know, this dilemma of how to stand up for individual rights, minority rights, you know, just the larger human, humanist project versus the resentment and very often legitimate resentments of a larger majoritarian uh, you know, population. That's true even in India, you know, and there's this big fights going on, on on many grounds, on communal grounds, on individual rights, et cetera. Just how do you see, what's the new way to negotiate that? Have you spent any time thinking about it? How do well, you- I've definitely, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've definitely spent time thinking about it, but I'm not sure that, Spending time thinking about it is not um, is not a sure road to coming up with a, a solution. <laughs> I do think I really want to emphasize a I want I want to emphasize a point that I started with, which is because you use the term majoritarian. That may well be the Indian story. I don't think it's the American story. That um, I think we're talking about an intense minority that is ex that is extremely anti science. Extre you know, ex hates government. Um, is um, is prone to conspiracy theorizing, is uh, willing to invest in, um, in politicians and causes that are, that are fundamentally anti-democratic. And not always knowing that that's the, the, the element of it, but, but clearly um, not uh, concerned enough about these risks of democratic backsliding. Um, the, you know, again, in public opinion polls, for what it's worth, right, a lot of these things are very popular. People think that, you know, people think that having uh, expanded voting rights is a good thing. It's a national right, to, a national guaranteed right to vote. They 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 want to have universal paid leave on the on the economic front. Uh, they they like um, the child tax credit. Um, but um, so I think the disconnect here is is that um, is twofold. One is there's not a lot of intensity on that side. I mean, this is actually an interesting case, right? The abortion decision that is likely to come from the Supreme Court and is already in draft form, right, galvanizing so many progressives, that could create some intensity, right? Not among a majority of Americans, but among a very intense minority and maybe intense minority that's willing to donate to candidates. So we'll see how that plays out. But it's not an intense majority that supports a lot of these causes, right? There's a taken for granted quality. Of course, science will still guide some of our policymaking. Of course, we're not going to see American democracy get blown up. Um, and, um, you know, and most people are thinking most of the time about their own lives. And, um, and so I think for Democrats, the challenge is you've got this kind of latent majority. How do you, how do you get it to see the stakes, right? And how do you focus 
on a few issues that are really going to help you build a, a larger majority because Democrats basically need 60%. They need like a 60% majority in the country to be able to be kind of guaranteed that they're going to get what they want uh, in politics at the national level. Um, and that, you know, you mentioned the Electoral College. I just want to repeat again, the Senate is so stacked against the Democrats, right? Democrats have basically they represent the majority of the nation's population and have done so for the last 20 years or so. And yet they haven't had a majority in the Senate over this entire period. In fact, they've often been in the minority. Um, right. Um, and um, and then because the U.S. has single member districts. Right. It's and you've got most Democrats are crowded into more urban metro areas. Then you also see a massive amount of wasted votes for Democrats. So Republicans are winning really handily outside of metro areas. And so they're also getting an edge through that. So I think it's really important to remember that we're, this is not a fair fight. And any strategy that's sort of formed in our heads about how do you do this um, brilliant, you know, jujitsu that will allow us to preserve the enlightenment, but also uh, speak to a majority of citizens, it has to be recognized the fact that in the, in our, it's a, the ugly political reality that if you you really need to have a, a strategy that can that can win, given the nature of your coalition, you know, sixty percent uh, on a consistent basis, and that's hard. That's really hard in a deeply polarized nation. So you you also, I mean, saying that not to mistake this fierce voice, uh, you know, which is conservative and culturally regressive, as being the voice of the nation. You know, you're saying there's a kind of organized outrage, and uh, to use your exactly. phrase organized outrage, organized money, right. infrastructure of outrage that's being used to camouflage deep economic divides, which is also being right. designed, you know, to serve uh, a very right. tiny 1%. So, you know, that gives one, one sense of, you were just saying, Jacob, that you were at a conference where there was a lot of discussion about freeing democracies across the world, you know, this yeah. phrase of illiberal democracy is being used. And one is seeing that, that, you know, it's a big dilemma that what if, those you constitutionally don't agree with are voted into power. Do you yes. live with it? How do you fight back? So even if you're not an expert on India, you know, just listening to uh, debates around it, what are the common factors that you see uh, about you know, democracy that's facing whether Europe or America, Canada here? Uh, are there any common factors that you see? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think one common factor is a sense of um, kind of lost faith in, in, um, in the sort of democratic capitalist project, if you will. And people often say, well, look, inequality is not as high in Europe or, you know, in other countries where you've seen this. But I think it's important to recognize that it's not just inequality, right? It's a sense of, um, and we've seen this across a, a lot of the world, right? A sense for a significant chunk of the people that they no longer have uh, the opportunity to sort of gain education, get ahead. And democracy really rests on the idea that there's this sort of coalition of those who are economically successful and those who believe they can become economically successful, who are kind of bought into the system. And, and I think the 2008 uh, financial crisis, can, it cannot be overstated as a kind of shock to that sense. So that's one common factor. The second is um, the, the, the illiberal movements, right, they're not completely disassociated from themselves, right? I mean, if you think of Brexit, you know, it, you know, Steve Bannon is helping with Trump and also over there, you know, cheering on Bre Brexit. It's not that these folks are like, uh, you know, coordinating a worldwide strategy, but there are these common themes. They're playing on common resentments. Immigration is obviously and a sense of like, you know, particularly among what um, what scholars would call sons of the soil, you know, people who feel like they are the original members of the society, there's a sense of displacement that's common there. And then last thing, I'll just say really quick, because you asked, so, what, so what's going on in all these countries? You know, yeah, I think that though there are these common forces, it does play out differently based on the kind of political institutions and the nature of, of the political economy. So inequality, United States is this very odd combination of distinctive institutions that advantage non-urban areas um, and that make it really hard to do anything. And this extreme inequality, right, which you do not see in other, at least other rich democracies. And, and so that combination is what allows, you know, we've gone from being a stable, prosperous democracy to a country that is on the verge of having its democracy collapse, right? That is a real threat 
Um, and so I think that's a, a sign of just how, how, how uh, large those two shocks are. That is our, the way our institutions work and the way um, our political economy has become so unequal. Right. So I, I won't do a deep dive on India, you know, because that's a topic for another conversation. But, you know, why I was trying to button was to say, you know, we have identified this, you know, the economic inequality, the politics of distraction, the structured outrage yeah. that's being created. But I'm just trying to delve one deep, uh, one layer lower, Jacob, which is yeah. to say that if, you know, if there is this kind of uh, mood in, in, democracies yes uh, how do we create space you know where people can feel heard can feel there you know say on the issue of immigration i've heard a lot of otherwise people who are not hate mongering but have issues when there's a big demographic shift in their particular locality and their argument is that as liberal elites you're sitting in the capitals you know it's not like new york is overrun by a place or delhi is not overrun by a particular demographic shift but you feel it keenly in certain spaces you know and yeah. so i think the point i'm making is uh i mean is, is it like more challenging and more radical now to somehow create space in our democracies where it's not woke you know, liberal fundamentalism and progressive fundamentalism, and it's not Christian conservative fundamentalism, religious fundamentalism as it's happening in India, but like a new space. Uh, and so here's the question I want to ask you that, do you think um, sort of liberal values, progressive values, secularization of societies happened too fast for people to emotionally keep up? And is there an argument to be made where you stick with the ideals, but you kind of move a little bit slower. Like I'm being very tentative while I'm saying this, yeah. but I'm just trying to find like, is there just ground now to listen, to move slower? I don't know, you know, because it's awful. And one other factor we haven't talked about, which I do want your thoughts on is technology. Because we've talked about economic divides. We've talked about conservatism, you know, and this mood. Yeah. And then there's the huge role of how technology is driving all this, you know, so. I totally agree. I mean, I think, I think I become more and more aware of and appreciative of, not in a good way, the role of technology. And, and it, it, it's, it's changing things on, in two spheres, right? It's really changing our democracy. And I think of social media as kind of the, the leading example of that in the way in which it can be weaponized, um, particularly to pr promote hatred. Um, and, and then I also think of the, just the, the, this pace of technological displacements in the economy too, right? Um, and those two come together, I think, to create a really a kind of volatile environment. But, you know, your question, I, I mean, I'm, if I knew the answer right, I, I would definitely be out there saying it very loudly. My sense is that clearly that there has to be space for these conversations and we have to slow down a bit in terms of the, you know, the, some of these large scale social changes have happened very quickly, but that the backlash is not, I think, driven so much by the pace of it, but by the nature of the politics around it. And so to me, the, um, to me, that the, the, um, the, 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 the most notable feature of this, I think, is the lack, the sort of fundamental organizational imbalance in, so we essentially have a society now in which we have sort of uh, very weak movements that represent a broad cross section of Americans that bring them together. Um, and we have very strong movements that represent the financial and economic elite on the one hand, and um, the outraged stokers of the right on the other. And, you know, you think about the weakness of some of the, the key progressive organizations. Labor has lost enormous ground. Environmental organizations have proven to be extremely ossified in their capacity to deal with climate change, the old line environmental organizations, um, and to mobilize young people, right? So there's like this untapped potential. And at least in the United States, I feel as if we've lost a lot of what de Tocqueville focused on in his work, which is these kind of intermediate institutions that would play this role. Because most the most important conversations that we have should not take place in the halls of government, right? They should only, they, those, they should become conversations in government only after they've been conversations in society. But we don't have those conversations and we don't have places to have them. And, um, and partly it is the fact that we don't 
we're not together. We're not together in social media for sure, right? We have our own echo chambers, but increasingly in the United States, we're not together in the places we live, right? Because of the growing uh, sorting and polarization of, of place. And um, so that's why I think organizations are kind of fundamental. I, I do think in the short term, these organizations are gonna have to be progressively oriented to really have impact. That is to say, it would be a luxury to have sort of a set of kind of moderate organizations that would kind of span the ideological divide. And I think we need to rebuild those. And labor did play that role, um, that it was a kind of middle-class organization and incorporated a lot of differing views. But, um, but if you think about why the, the left can't translate electoral wins into policy results, why it's, um, it's losing on the ground so often, it's because it doesn't have a very strong infrastructure to do things, particularly outside of Washington. And so, you know, building progressive groups and turning social movements like Black Lives Matter into real organizations is you need that. And um, and, there, you know, there's no there's no way to resist kind of forces of a liberalism if there aren't organized forces of of liberalism broadly conceived. So yeah. to me, that's, um, I'm an, I'll, ultimately, I'm a kind of structuralist and organizationalist at heart. And, um, you know, I do think that the, the rhetoric and the ideas and the, the um, discourse matter enormously. I just don't think I have any great insights into how to change them. I do know how to change organizations. So yeah. I think we need to build organizations that can, that can really do what you're talking about. Yeah, I think that, you know, that's something which anyone being here in India would absolutely resonate with because here the opposition party, you know, which is the Congress has absolutely no vehicles, no structures. And exactly. like you said, all the liberal movements, you know, from people's movements to women's rights movements to grassroots movements, all of that have kind of lost their steam and their mojo, you know. It's as if once they achieved a certain a uh, raft of liberal values and justice was done or, you know, constitutionally, legally, some rights were won. It's as if those movements completely lost their steam, you know, whereas yeah. the conservative and angry groups are now wanting their rights. So they have more energy and their vehicles have more energy, you know. So you're right. It is a big structural battle at every level. So I'm not going to ask you how to put the genie back, you know, because I think you've answered that, but I'll ask it anyway, in case you have like that one takeaway line about how to put it back. You know? No, I don't have a takeaway line, how to put it back. I will say that despite all that um, I've said, and we've discussed, um, I remain optimistic at heart and, um, and I'm not, you know, I'm not sure if that's just a, a, a character flaw or trait, <laughs> but, um, but I think, I think that my optimism stems from a, a couple of realities. One is that we have seen enormous progress in these areas. It comes in this sort of zigzag pattern of social change. And there's nothing, you know, there's, I'm not, you know, there's no inevitability to it, but it's, it's a potential there. And it's often the case that people feel most despairing before these breakthroughs occur. Um, and the second is, I think, um, that I, I actually think in the United States, as I said, there's a, there are both underlying demographic and social shifts and, um, and um, sort of baseline popularity that support um, the long term, a better sort of long term bargain. And, and that bargain would be, based, in my view, would be a more economically populist than where the Democrats have been, right? Much more focused on regulating the market, making sure that people, um, not that they have to rely on, on government assistance, but that they have good jobs that provide good benefits and a sense that they can have upward mobility in them. And that bargain would also include on the other side, right, a, a kind of a turning down of, of the heat on some of these cultural um, controversies, but it can't be at the expense of kind of a core fundamental goal of, of, of equality in the United States and by civic equality, right? Right now we're seeing assaults on civic equality, right? And, um, and to me, that's, I mean, I see, I see extreme anti-abortion laws as an assault on civic equality and women's autonomy. I see, uh, uh, restrictive voting laws as a huge assault on racial and uh, racial equality and civic equality more generally. Um, 
And, and I see the use of racial dog whistling as an assault on that, right? That there's a reasonable discussion about what we should teach in schools, right? Um, it's, it's illiberal and wrong to, you know, to, to essentially um, use the issue of slavery or <laughs> the issue, I shouldn't even call the issue of slavery, but like uh, uh, to use the, 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 the sort of teaching of history about America's dark past as a, as a vehicle essentially for shutting down free discourse in schools and or in society. And so too with um, rights for, for, for LB, LBGQT people, so too for all of these areas, these are, these are not things we, that you can compromise on. The, the basic idea of human equality, you can't compromise on. Um, you can compromise on how you achieve it and how fast you achieve it, but you can't compromise on the goal, so. Yep. And so I'm optimistic because I do think that the long arc of history bends towards justice and equality. That's a really good and, and, and I think a very emphatic note to end on, you know, and I think if I just loop back to something that you said, that if you stick with this raft of values as being non-negotiable, but you, you know, that one has the humility to address the other, you know, wounds that people are feeling, which is like you said, the loss of self-esteem, the loss of jobs and get more creative about addressing that, then these two things may not be so much at war, you know, like one substitute for totally, the other. So. I agree. I think one of the problems with status, right, is that it has this kind of zero sum quality, but, but if you, you know, uh, Heather McGee has a wonderful um, book on this, The Sum of Us, where she has this metaphor of the public pool. So, you know, when the South desegregated, all the public pools where people swam um, white people swam were drained because the white people didn't want to have black people swimming with them. And this is a negative sum thing, right? The white people don't get to swim anymore in the public pool, right? Not just, the, it's not just leaving out the black people. And her point is like, we have to recapture the idea of kind of a positive sum conception of social cooperation. And that was the theme of American amnesia, but far more than in American amnesia, her work really emphasizes this, this, this means coming to terms with America's racial past and racial contemporary racial divides. And I think, yeah, I think we're having a lot. Maybe that's the, that's the very last thing to end on. I'm also a little optimistic um, because we're having these conversations, not just you and me, but um, across our society. Um, and you don't, you don't know what's at stake until, it's until you face really existential challenges. And I think we're, we're talking about political reform, how we grapple with race, how democracy has to evolve in the 21st century, what those grievances are that are undermining it, and so on. We're talking about those in a way that we weren't. Um, and that's a, that's a big step forward. Um, so I hope, I hope it continues and it's positive and not negative. Thank you very much, Jacob. It was a real, real pleasure speaking with you. And, and you as well. Thanks. Bye. Bye.